Hi everyone, Theta here for the fourth Casual Monday of the Fall 2018 season. There are jump links in the description below if you want to skip around to specific shows in this week's lineup. I want to express my apologies for last week's delay as I had computer issues and didn't want to stop the video making process to narrow the problem down. This ended up being a good decision as I definitely bricked my system for a day or so after I pushed last week's episode live. Hopefully we are out of the water on that. Um, I appreciate your patience. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you that just because a show does not feature in today's video does not mean I've dropped it. This lineup of shows is going to change each week depending on whether I feel I have something meaningful to say or not. Shows with a strong comedy focus are especially likely to miss the cut a lot as humor is very entertaining, but often a poor subject for analysis. Lastly, something will happen on the channel tomorrow that I want you to be forewarned about. Several people have requested that I do a standalone show on our Bunny Girl Senpai anime, as it has given me quite a lot to talk about and is usually the longest segment. While doing a full show is counter to the whole idea behind this casual format, another discussion suggested that I simply release those segments as their own videos. This goes back to that question from the first video about whether or not to render all the sections separately. Now keeping the single show with jump links was the overwhelming favored choice, so that is what I have done. However, it's not a terrible idea to release just that segment as its own standalone video, as they mostly have enough content. This will make it easier for people searching specifically for analysis on that series to find their way to this channel. Now I am not taking Bunny Girl Senpai out of the Casual Monday lineup, but I am going to release that section as its own video in addition to the Casual Monday show, probably a day later. Uh, there will be no new content in those videos, so there's no need to watch both. It will be presented as an excerpt from this show with reference back to the original. Tomorrow then, I'm going to push out all four of those segments. The first three will be in one video though, so that I don't spam everybody's feed. Uh, just know that if you watch today's show, there's nothing new in what comes tomorrow. If that is actually the only show you care about though, from now on you can just watch the excerpt that releases on Tuesdays. In the future, when I start putting effort into visibility, something like picking a few shows to release excerpt from, or even rotating shows each week, is an option I don't think is too onerous, and so you can consider this a type of experiment. For now though, here is Casual Monday. The thing I want to talk about today in Golden Kamui is one of the things I like most about the series, and that is the wide array of motivations among the cast. The main thing that draws every person into the story is the gold. It's like a hunt for buried treasure, complete with a very bizarre map. This sets characters on a collision course with one another who would otherwise never even cross paths, and creates allies out of those who would otherwise come to blows. But what gives the character such a richness as a whole is that they almost all want to chase down the gold for different reasons. Yes, some just want the gold because they want money, such as Shiraishi, because it's the only the wealth itself that drives them. These characters tend to be less principled and predictably less loyal. This latest episode suggests that just such loyalty is about to be tested. But for most of the characters, the gold is the means toward some other end, something they do care about. Lieutenant Tsurumi wants to restore purpose to the troops beneath him by taking over Hokkaido, as they feel they lost much more than they gained by fighting in the war. Hijikato wants to create a new nation and a new Shinsungumi. The Ainu themselves originally pulled the money to buy weapons so that they could resist the Japanese and their continued encroachment. For all of those factions, securing the gold would lead to actually more conflict. There are also those who are driven by more personal reasons, who are nevertheless caught up in the whole affair. The crazy doctor innkeeper lady, Ianaga, gets drawn in purely by being one of the tattooed prisoners, and now is an ally just in order to survive. We saw in the latest episode that Shinpachi is motivated in a significant way by loyalty to Hijikata owing to a type of fraternal allegiance among the former Shinsungumi. 
And while Nikaido was originally just one of the many renegade uh, 7th Division soldiers, he is now driven purely by vengeance for his twin, even discarding his original loyalty to sell out another. His is perhaps the most obvious example of how character motivations are transformative and even destructive in the series, as his brush with death and obsession with Sugimoto have broken something in him mentally, and he now wears his own severed ear around his neck so that he can whisper to it when he's talking to himself. There are also motivations that aren't perfectly understood, like the guy who has kept one of the fake skins, or Aspira's uncle, who may actually be a Russian partisan, even if he seems to be acting on behalf of the Ainu, or the fortune teller lady, who we know is motivated by money, but has no obvious reason to get caught up in something as dangerous as the hunt for the gold. And then, of course, the original instigator, Noparabu, and why he would go to such lengths to ensure his comrades end up with the stolen gold. Finally, there are the two main characters, who are sympathetic in a lot of ways because of the reason they are driven to be part of the whole affair. Sugimoto originally just wanted to make a small bit of money to support his friend's war widow. It wasn't for his own enrichment at all, and was something he just stumbled into. Aspiro wanted answers about her father's death and to try to right the wrong that is inflicted on her people. Each of them has actually changed in motivation over the course of the story. As we saw in the horse race episode, Sugimoto is no longer driven only by uh, the desire to take care of his friend's widow. He now is dedicated to helping Aspira find uh, her way to some resolution. Aspira herself is still trying to find out what happened in the ambush, but the texture has changed entirely, because her father was not the victim, but the culprit. Now she is haunted by the person he was to her compared to the person he might actually be and she needs to understand why there is a difference. Thus, even though these two have shifted in their motive, the central lodestone of the treasure and the map maker are still the key goalpost in their journey. Thus, the gold at the center of the story reveals itself to metaphorically be exactly what money itself was created for, to be a stand-in for other desires. Very few people want money just because they want money. It's the other things money can bring them that motivate even if it's just the status of having a lot of it. We exchange our effort for money, and then exchange that money for our desires. Money is like some kind of magic substance that one can convert into almost anything one desires. But despite that awesome power, money is not rare or precious. It's everywhere, and you can acquire it through a thousand different means. It shortens the distance between what you want and what you're capable of down to just two steps. It's actually kind of incredible if you step back and look at it that way. Thus, in Golden Kamui, the story gets its complexity and shifting loyalties and surprises because of the magical way that all these different motives can be satisfied by pursuing the same thing. A pot of gold at the end of a bloody rainbow. It's normal for stories to feature characters with motivations which are at odds, but in this one, the whole cast is pursuing the same thing. It's like they are all somewhat possessed by the spirit of this gold, which is probably exactly what the title refers to. So moving on to Bunny Girl Senpai, uh, let's talk about Laplace's demon. We mentioned it last time and how it is sort of the conceptual opposite to Schrodinger's cat. Uh, just to remind everyone, these are actual science concepts that are being used as an analogy. I don't think they are meant to explain what is going on. The person reaching for these metaphors is Futaba, and she's characterized as being a science and logic type. A literature student might reach for a literary analogy to explain the situation, but she is most familiar with science metaphors and thought experiments, so that is what she reaches for. Adolescent syndrome is ultimately something supernatural, and as we mentioned last time, the unintuitive nature of physics makes for a great parallel to the complexity and confusion of relationships. Anyway, Laplace's demon is about determinism, that future events proceed out of the past with certainty, much different from multiple outcomes waiting to collapse into one. All of Tomoe's attempts to stop getting asked out by throwing hints failed. Everyone but her and Sakata proceeded in the same way each day, and the dude always tried to confess. Everyone else's behavior then seems to be predetermined. They were always going to react the same way to the same inputs. 
Thus, Tomoe is Laplace's demon by knowing how people were going to react. Of course, Sakuta also knew. He knew Mai would agree to date if he pressed a little harder, so the second time through, he skipped right to pressing her. Why was he the only other person who was retaining memories of the time loop? I think it's worth pointing out that we don't know the nature of Sakuta's run-in with adolescent syndrome. It seems both related to and separate from Kayade's incident. His sister was being bullied, and that seemed to manifest as physical injury. They stopped her symptoms by sequestering her away from school and the internet, but that is not the same thing as solving the problem, right? They've treated the symptoms, but not the disease. Even besides that, why did he end up getting cut across his chest? The hospitalization incident that started rumors about him happened after the phantom injury, as a result of it. So what was his adolescent syndrome situation? Is it linked to why he was the last one able to see Mai, or even able to see her at all in the very first scene? Is it linked to why he also remembered the June 27th time loop? I don't think that he is also Laplace's demon, right? Because presumably it would have reset on the day that he failed to ask out Mai, not the days he succeeded. Unless remaining technically single is the thing he secretly desires for some reason. Now, although he and Mai are not dating thanks to the reset, this also means that he has a chance to initiate their relationship with something a little more grand. Him getting her to agree after cornering her during a lunch conversation is a little anticlimactic after the shouted confession and rescuing her from invisibility and a month of confessing to her, right? Don't get me wrong, this whole bit was freaking adorable, but the second time, less so and I feel like he might have continually screwed around with her in subsequent repeats. He now knows that she really will say yes, but she doesn't know that he knows that. You rascal. He also now knows about her role in the TV show, and knows that she was going to screw with him by saying that there is a kissing scene. And he knows that she kissed him during the time that she was invisible, believing it might wake him up like a fairy tale princess but she doesn't know that he knows all that. It'll be interesting to see if he comes clean. He screwed up once already by assuming he'd get another chance to ask her out and didn't repair the misunderstanding right away. Perhaps this chastises him for being overconfident, or perhaps he's just going to keep pushing his luck. Although I first worried that this misunderstanding was going to inject division between him and Mai, the final scene pretty well alleviates that fear. She waited for him to come explain and apologize, but she's not going to just let it sit unresolved. I imagine she'll be way more annoyed at him for not clearing it up as soon as possible than she is about what actually happened. There is a confidence in what they have here, and a confidence she has in herself. If I'm reading her character right, then she isn't going to be unreasonably jealous about the incident with Tomoe, but she is going to lay on the guilt just to tweak him. She will thoroughly enjoy watching him squirm, but isn't actually going to push him away. Once he explains everything, I imagine she'll actually be understanding. After all, didn't he put himself out for her sake when she had her own crisis? Isn't that just the kind of guy he is? Maybe it makes her feel a little less special, but she already knew that he went through a lot of changes for his sister's sake. There is precedent. Ultimately, too, he is doing this for Mai as much or more than he is for Tomoe. Right now, the time loop appears to have been stopped thanks to the basketball dude thinking that Tomoe and Sakuta are a thing. If that misunderstanding is cleared up, things might reset. If things reset, he can never get to the tomorrow he wants where he and Mai are together. I feel like Mai can understand that line of thinking, though I fully expect her to delight in punishing him for the situation. Reminds me a lot of the beginning of Nisa Monogatari, actually, uh, but I think I'm going to stop making comparisons to the Monogatari series, even though there are quite a few of them, because I'm pretty sure anyone familiar with both will be able to draw the link. All of that is me saying that I think Mai and Sakata are probably just fine. But what I am dubious about is the solution they have come up with to allow the misunderstanding to continue. I understand the logic, right? It drives the dude away without embarrassing him or revealing that he crushed on Tomoe rather than Rina. But as Sakuta points out, 
she is about to tell a lie to the entire school. That might have some unintended consequences because they are putting a lie out into the atmosphere, which seems to have a bad habit of making things come true. I don't know exactly what that might mean, but let's go ahead and talk about this notion of atmosphere, okay? Uh, the way it has been described by Sakata in those earlier episodes makes it sound like atmosphere is another way of saying the prevailing social norms. We are social creatures, and we take cues from others to inform our own behavior. Every grouping of people has its own range of behaviors and beliefs that are acceptable and those which are not. Your work environment probably has a different atmosphere than your friend circle, which has its own sub-atmosphere relative to the larger group of your peers, and so on, out to where whole nations have their distinct notions of what belongs and what doesn't. Whether or not we are always conscious of it, we take hints from the others around us. It's why we lower our voice when we enter a bookstore, or stand up to applaud once others start doing so. One of the driving motivations behind keeping up with fashion is that it's a way to signal to others that you obey social norms, that you are socially competent. You are on the inside of the boundaries of what is acceptable, making you safe to approach. You can even see this in which anime shows are acceptable to like or not. If the fandom deems a show acceptable to hate, you can bet people will come out of the woodwork to crap on it rather than just ignore it as something they don't care for. Anyway, if there is one environment where this atmosphere is particularly palpable, it's a high school. A pressure cooker of people figuring themselves out and preparing to face adulthood and sorting out how to navigate social currents and read the atmosphere is part of that process. In our series, this atmosphere can alter reality itself. Once it becomes okay by social norms to bully Kaede, once that is what the atmosphere deems acceptable, then this abuse manifests physically. Mai started school after social groups had coalesced, putting her on the outside of the social circles. She was considered an outsider, and so it became socially normal to ignore her presence. She read this environment correctly and embraced it, in no small part because of enjoying the relative anonymity. But thanks to adolescent syndrome, the accepted atmosphere began changing actual reality, causing the universe itself to start ignoring her. I think this somewhat oppressive version of the atmosphere is actually cleverly represented in the story by the density of students in most scenes. Animating background characters takes time and resources, and if you've watched much anime, you should recognize that this series puts way more background students into the scenes than is normal. This is especially obvious and out of place on the train and on the street near the school, which are actually places outside of the school itself. And yet, the environment is packed with students and their conversations and interactions and all the social cues and hints they're taking from one another. This density reinforces the substance of this atmosphere idea, that it is a thick and pervasive even outside the school grounds. It has presence far beyond some abstract idea. Now, we still don't know exactly what happened with Sakuta, but if we look at Tomoe's example, we can see once again that it is the acceptance of a social group that is at the center of things. The dude asking her out isn't her concern at all. She's worried about the repercussions of turning him down as it relates to her class and friend group. She's afraid of the embarrassment of being alone should she lose her only friends. They even allude to the potential for more adolescent syndrome problems in the future with Futaba's new love crisis, which means all of these instances have something in common. They center around rejection, around being made to feel on the outside. Even the hospitalization incident creates rumors that uh, create an outsider situation for Sakata. We will probably have to wait to see more of Tomoe's situation or learn more about Sakata's situation to understand completely what the atmosphere is capable of. Maybe it's the fear of rejection being manifest. Maybe the atmosphere is the collective unconscious and it imposes rejection on its own. But I am sure that it is all about social in-groups and out-groups and particularly how an individual relates to those ideas. Maya's desire to go to a world where no one knew her probably influenced what happened to her, but right now I feel like her status as outsider was also a requirement for her disappearance to have triggered. Anyway, 
Next time, I imagine we will see how the atmosphere reacts to the lie and how Mai reacts to Sakata's plan. And then I guess I will react to those reactions. Bloom Into You this time sets up an initial characterization of our first prominent guy character by first introducing a seemingly unrelated development. Nanami wants to get the student council more involved in the cultural festival by reviving a student council stage show tradition. However, this idea is opposed by their two first year students, Yu and Maki. This characterizes Yu as someone who can be very stubborn about things she doesn't want to do. It also characterizes Maki, who explains that the whole reason he is interested in student council is because he likes being in the role of support. He'd rather be the one running the spotlight than the one in the spotlight. The first half of the episode then puts the matter aside to focus on Yu and Nanami's private relationship once more, ultimately resulting in Nanami getting a chance to kiss Yu with something a little bit more like consent. Nanami is awkwardly eager once again, underscoring her inexperience with romantic feelings. She can't help but push the matter, and this recklessness results in their kiss actually being seen this time. This could be disastrous for a variety of reasons, so Yu understandably panics when Maki reveals what he witnessed. Instead, this is likely going to be a positive development, and the reason is Maki's character. We get an extended metaphor of his history with romance as he watches said history like an audience member in a movie theater. He was comfortable being a confidant to girls because of having only sisters, and over time came to prefer this spectator position. This draws a parallel to his experience playing team sports, where he eventually found himself gravitating toward a support role rather than being a participant. This naturally led him to being involved in the student council, which the first part of the episode already set up. This preference extends to his orientation to romance. However, having one of the girls who confide in him turn her affection toward him is untenable. He wants to work behind the scenes, not be on stage. Perhaps that incident would have scared him away from getting involved in anyone else's romance in the future. It's no good having him get drawn to the story. In his situation, what then becomes the perfect romance to watch? One between two girls. There is no risk of their affection straying toward him. He will always be the spectator. Because this was previously set up as his whole motivation for being in the student council to begin with, we accept his explanation of why he would be most happy simply watching Yu and Nanami interact. Then, when he comes clean with what he saw with Yu at the earliest opportunity, she is inclined to trust him also. That trust means that she listens to him when he points out that her first concern was not for herself, but for Nanami. And I imagine this is not going to be the last time he helps her see something about herself. Now, I said earlier that her resistance to the stage show suggests that she can be very stubborn about things she doesn't want to do. She is self-conscious about being someone who just goes with the flow, and so sometimes she overcorrects. Oftentimes, then, she is not easily persuaded. Yet, she let Nanami talk her into answering the boy who confessed to her in middle school. She let Nanami talk her into giving the campaign speech and to being involved in the student council. This time, she even talked her into sharing a kiss. Without the example of her opposition to the stage play, maybe we'd think that she was just a pushover. But she does seem to bend whenever it comes to Nanami's attentions. Despite what she is telling herself about feeling nothing, her own behavior indicates that she is pliable to Nanami's desire. This seems especially true if it involves Nanami paying attention to her, whether it was holding her hand during the phone conversation in the beginning or staying behind after student council let out earlier this episode. There is something about being in Nanami's focus that Yu finds agreeable. It does not seem like Yu likes attention for attention's sake, though, as she doesn't want Nanami to draw attention to them by walking too closely in the hallway, or coming to fetch her rather than the other way around, or even standing on stage in front of the rest of the student body. This makes me think that you might go along with being on stage more willingly if she thinks of it in terms of Nanami watching her, not so much everyone else. She dismisses the way she thinks of Nanami first after Maki's reveal as being normal, but I suspect with enough examples of her doing things just for Nanami's sake, she will eventually realize what that probably means. 
In Irodoku this week, we had the long-awaited introduction of Kohaku, who has changed the story in largely the way we guessed. Her second-hand characterization as a bit of a loose cannon, and someone energetic and charismatic, painted her as the polar opposite to Hitomi. However, she learned in her studies abroad not to be so frivolous with magic, to treat it with a little more gravity. She is a changed and more serious person. For like, two seconds. I said last time that I liked the choice of letting Hitomi set up her initial social circle and join the club before Kohaku came into the story, largely because of the influence that I thought Kohaku would have over her and the way her own personality might overshadow Hitomi's. This has largely borne out, as Kohaku proves herself skilled at nudging Hitomi to go along with her whims, and she commands the lion's share of attention whenever the two of them are in the same place. Had Kohaku been there from the beginning, it seems unlikely that Hitomi would have gotten involved with something as low-key as the Photography Arts Club, or had the moments between just her and Yuito. Hitomi tends to go with the flow, such as simply repeating what someone else has ordered at the cafe, while Kohaku strikes out to do her own thing. Kohaku's characterization goes beyond simply a force of chaos, though. Although I'm sure no high school girl likes to imagine herself in her 70s, Kohaku doesn't reject their familial relationship. She doesn't necessarily want to be called Oba-chan, but she is immediately affectionate and attentive to Hitomi. She's supportive. She is super curious about her own future, but decides it's better if she doesn't know. Thus, her interest in Hitomi is not because of what she can learn from her, but because of who she is and what she can do for her. Hitomi in the future had retracted from everyone, seemed to have classmates and acquaintances, but no friends. She appears to be close to her grandmother and no one else. She had taken some first initial steps on her own with these club members, and I do think that's important, but being able to have a peer she trusts like Kohaku is going to escalate her confidence as we go forward. This is clear in two different instances. One is Hitomi being willing to come clean about being from the future. They started out being careful about not talking about that around the others, but once they slip up, Hitomi is comfortable sharing the secret uh, with Kohaku's encouragement. There was skepticism about Hitomi and magic earlier in the series when she appeared in Yuito's room, right? But with Kohaku's involvement, even something like time travel doesn't really phase the others. Sharing the secret with them is a mark of Hitomi changing into someone who can trust others just a little bit more, and having her supportive grandmother beside her makes this key step just a little bit easier. The success then parlays into the second instance of Kohaku aiding her confidence, which is in their combined magic to put the train illusion into the night sky. Like we said last time, Hitomi seems to be able to do magic if she isn't thinking about it, which she does earlier this episode with the train in the classroom. Struggling to do magic on purpose suggests a mental block, a nervousness or a lack of confidence. It's not a lack of ability. This time, though, she does magic on purpose and successfully, and I think she is largely burgeoned by knowing that she is combining magic with Kohaku. It may be, too, that the fact that it was Yuito's drawing helped prod Hitomi along, but I don't think she owns up to being from the future or attempts to put the drawing in the sky without Kohaku there to buttress her. It's a nice visual representation of the club at the end there as well. Assuming Kohaku does get to join the magic club to the photography arts club, the photograph they take at the end is a direct representation of the future. It's a drawing, manifested by magic, and then photographed with all of the members in the frame as well. Last thing to note is that Hitomi was okay revealing she's from the future, but still wanted to protect the secret of her colorblindness. This may seem like a weird sense of priorities. Not being able to see color is small potatoes compared to being a literal time traveler. I think the difference is that time travel was a one-time event that happened to Hitomi, while being colorblind is a personal deficiency. It's a flaw of sorts. It's something she is insecure about, and we are usually slow to share our weakness with people we meet. She may even feel like she is to blame, as she links it to magic and the fact that she is a mage. There is definitely a missing story there. This may all be tied up in why her parents seem to be absent in the future. 
And if so, then that seems like a story that she is going to want to avoid sharing with Kohaku if she can. But even if I'm way off on that, the colorblindness is something very personal to Hitomi. Yuito, knowing this about her, creates a link between them. And so long as he guards this vulnerability of hers, I think she will naturally grow to trust him. He is the one who brings up monochromatic photography to nudge her to join, after all, and he makes his train drawing in black and white as well. He's perceptive, which means that he is also the one who zeroes in on the lingering question that Hitomi's time travel raises. Is she going to return to the future one day? No one knows the answer to that right now, but either answer is going to influence the kind of relationships that she can build here in this time. What I want to talk about today with Karakuri Circus is a way it falls outside normal shonen tropes, which is in how it defies the competent zone. The competent zone in a story is basically the age range within which characters are competent. Characters older or younger than this range tend to be, well, incompetent, but are also usually accessory to the story. They won't be the primary movers of narrative. The trick with the competence zone is that it varies depending on the work, but it always includes the age range of the target audience's demographics. So, if you want to market a story to high schoolers, then the high school students will be largely competent, with middle schoolers or adults being useless or unable to relate. But if that same story was marketed to middle schoolers, then it might suddenly be the high school characters who are too old and out of touch, with the middle schoolers being the competent ones. This is why you have so many clueless authority figures or whiny brats who just get in the way in anime at large, as the middle school to young adult age range is the most common competent zone. For shonen, it's, well, it's right there in the name. It's aimed at younger boys, and so the zone usually reaches into high school, but no further. So, what is interesting in Karakuri Circus, and something I alluded to last week, is that we have two adults who seem very competent despite shortcomings, and are considerably older than the third character, the 11-year-old boy who, by all rights, should be the one in the competent zone. However, this doesn't mean that the whole zone is shifted to later ages, as the third episode especially demonstrates that our kid, Masaru, will be portrayed as competent as well. He starts out relatively helpless in the series, almost a living MacGuffin that the characters try to take possession of. And to be fair, he's an elementary school kid in way over his head, contending with powerful automata and corporations. He's easily overpowered, and he's prone to crying when things seem dire. But he doesn't whine. He's not really a brat. He recognizes that others are putting out effort and suffering pain on his behalf, he isn't easily fooled by adults attempting to deceive him, and he tries to take his rescue into his own hands. He's defiant against those he doesn't trust, but earnest with those he does. And yet, even when he becomes more proactive, he remains uncertain. Though he prepares to escape his fate of being a pawn by going through the window, he is still terrified of the possible consequences. He is resolving to be strong, but not for his own sake. Rather, that so he can stop causing pain and trouble for Shirogane and Narumi. He ends up realizing he can wield his money as a tool, rather than it only being a liability. Anyway, that is the main thing I find interesting about the character setup so far. Um, I just want to make one other comment, which is about how the series handles the first blush of attraction between Shirogane and Narumi. Narumi has this weird condition where he has to make people laugh, and this crops up after he and Shirogane fall into the trap together. He knows he can't make her laugh with normal, wacky antics. He has already perceived her to be cold and distant. So he reasons that proposing she be his girl should strike her as ridiculous. It's a, ha, don't make me laugh kind of proposition. She doesn't laugh, right? But she says that it isn't funny. The idea of her being his girl is not a joke. This catches him off guard, and leads to her revealing the past that led to her puppet-like existence. That, of course, gives him the opportunity to challenge her impression of herself, giving a direction for her character arc at almost the same time that Masaru gains his. I thought this handling was pretty noteworthy. They basically slipped the setup for a first spark past us 
by shrouding it within Naramie's running shtick of needing others to laugh. Pivoting that into a believable moment for her to speak about her past suddenly gives a lot more purpose to his disease, which had only seemed like a bit of a running gag. For a certain magical index, I really just want to talk about characters who have just popped up in this fourth episode. Um, for those who also watch the Railgun side series, Item will need no introduction, as they were a big part of the expanded version of Misaka's Project Radio Noise arc that took up about half of Railgun S. I think Project Radio Noise and the developments that sprung from it are some of the strongest parts of the whole Raildex universe, so I'm kind of excited to see Item again. We probably won't get a rehash of the Mugino Misaka rivalry, but Meltdowner is confrontational and has a lot of swagger, so she brings a lot of tension and interest to her scenes. Who got more focus this time, though, was a guy named Hamazura, who seems to have been added to Item as some kind of low level gopher. We saw this guy once before, right at the end of Index 2 where he inherited skill out from the leader who was killed by Accelerator. He led the attack against Misaka's mother and eventually ends up on the receiving end of a Toma brand speech and punch. Though I wouldn't call working for Item being on the side of the good guys or anything, Hamazura seems to have come at least a little way from the guy who accepted a job to kill someone's mom. He has a few comments this episode, which suggests that he may have taken Toma's speech about extending a hand to those in need uh, to heart. If so, I can see him eventually being at odds with Item and probably the other Esper groups as well. After all, he was in Skill Out, whose whole identity was based around feeling victimized as level zeros. Anyway, this brings the number four Esper into the Index story at the same time that we meet the number two Esper, Kakane, a key member of school. This puts all of our top four espers on stage, with Accelerator over at Group, Mugino in Item, Kakene in School, and Misaka, um, doing her own thing, I guess. She's the only one who is unequivocally a good guy, so is definitely the outsider. Thus, looking at the setup from this one episode, it seems like we might have a brawl between these quasi-mercenary groups that all feature a level 5. Hamazuro's characterization and focus this episode suggests to me that he will be the moral outsider here. Like Toma, he does not derive his identity from his power because he has none. Rather, he is positioned to be caught in the middle and a spectator giving the audience a ringside yet somewhat impartial seat to what is going to develop from here. So for Gridman, uh, this episode was the first time I really enjoyed the Gridman Kaiju battles. It felt way less formulaic and blended into the city environment very well. Um, the failure to transmit the whole group and the scrambled video representation of this failure raises all kinds of questions about the nature of this reality something I'll probably visit more in a later week. Um, Akane is definitely the most interesting character to me at this point in time, something I mentioned last week. She is very popular, even unapproachable, which is the complete opposite of what you expect for someone living out some violent, monster-creating fantasy of killing people who annoy her, of someone living knee-deep in their own refuse. So, was her popular school persona always an act for her? Or did some event create this divide between the person she is and the person she presents? This episode reveals that she and Rika used to be closer, and Rika acts the way she does because of hoping they can spend time together. This makes a little more sense out of the ending credits, which primarily feature the two of them together, though I don't think it clears these credits up entirely. But now I have to wonder if whatever set Akane down this path is related to the distance that opened up between her and Rika. Akane doesn't seem to even realize it, so is their friendship ailing as a result of her kaiju preoccupation, or did the same event cause both? After all, Rika wonders to herself if she might be somehow responsible for the kaiju. She does so because they always seem to attack those near to her, but is it possible that she is right without guessing the real reason? A type of foreshadowing via misdirection? Part of the reason this is so curious to me is because of Yuta's amnesia. This time we learn that Gridman also has no memory, but he knows what his mission is. That's curious on its own, 
But Rika's comments about her and Akane this time made me realize that we never seem to get any look at these characters' pasts. Something happened the very first day because Rika questions if Yuta remembers anything that happened that day, but she doesn't elaborate and has never filled in the details any further. The support characters that show up to Rika's shop don't give any history about why they're involved with Gridman. There's no explanation of Yuta's past friendship with Utsumi. In fact, outside of discussions about other people not remembering the kaiju attacks, there are no flashbacks or even references to specific actions that occur before the moment that Yuta wakes up in episode 1. It's like nothing from before that actually exists as memories we can see or specific events that someone could refer to. Is that just a coincidence? Well, I'm certainly watching to find out. So for the second week in a row, Goblin Slayer opens with a prologue narration that likens the world our characters inhabit to a type of game that the gods are playing or have created. I feel this shares some overlap with Goblin Slayer's story last time about goblins coming from the green moon, and how they did so because they were envious of these lands. This story links envy itself to being goblin-like, as well as coming from the outside. This may suggest that the dice-throwing gods are the ones adding monsters to the world, or even adding destructive emotions like envy to the world, and the possibility that the gods come from the moons or are symbolized by them. The prominence of those moons in the opening credits during the dramatic silhouette and title screen, as well as being the final image of the end credits, serves to reinforce the idea that the moons have some kind of significance to our story. Speaking of those credits, after four episodes, I really am impressed by how well the opening suits the tone of the show. The OP has a very moody, frantic, and even apocalyptic feel to it, while its music is very different from the pop or rock intros that dominate opening themes. Goblin Slayer itself is very different in tone from most anime, and especially other fantasy anime, and this stark contrast in opening style matches this discrepancy well. Anyway, the actual episode serves to begin characterizing our three new adventurers who joined up last time. This first installment focuses particularly on our elf ranger. She gets a rude introduction to what goblins and goblin hunting are all about, starting with the indignity of being bathed in goblin blood. This continues with the filth of their nest and the treatment of their captive. The victim being a fellow elf makes the situation that much more real to her, and therefore more traumatic. Though she will first join the killing with enthusiasm, burning with vengeance as she is, the sheer volume of death and blood will begin to affect her, until she finally marvels at Goblin Slayer having done this sort of thing countless times by himself. Throw in the harrowing battle with the ogre, and the whole experience is not what I think she bargained for. As she says at the end, adventures are supposed to be fun, full of new experiences. The reality of goblin extermination clashes with that idea dramatically, which of course is something that has been a pattern in the show so far, overturning the assumptions that the priestess and us in the audience may have originally held about a fantasy adventure show. But give our elf girl credit. At the end, she resolves that one day she will take him on an actual adventure. This means that the event has opened her eyes, but did not break her spirit. She seems like she will be a great pressure point in the group's dynamics, as her hot-blooded nature contrasts sharply with Goblin Slayer's emotional void, the priestess's timidity, and our lizard man's stoicism. A lot of this episode happens from her point of view, and so I will not be surprised if we get subsequent episodes from others' points of view in order to characterize them more fully as well. We also had the ogre, who is leading this goblin den, make reference to the demon lords that our ranger mentioned last time, which might be the beginning of a link between the goblins that are Orkbolg's only concern and the wider conflict in the world. Telling the ogre that he was less troubling than goblins right before he finishes him was some pretty stone-cold shade, but I think he was serious. As he said last time, the world being in danger isn't an excuse to let the goblins live. Man, you can set your watch by this guy's determination. 
So just a little bit about Sword Art Online this time. We had our first real conflict as Kirito tries to enlist Yujo's help in thwarting the goblins to save Selka. But despite Kirito realizing he can use sword skills in this world, the fight is not some one-sided mop-up operation. In fact, when Kirito gets cut on the arm, he is nearly overwhelmed by the pain. He essentially loses the fight, being rescued from death by Yujo storming in. And yet, rather than some tired trope of the untrained guy with a sword saving the day because of his bravery, Yujo takes a mortal blow himself. Additionally, our big guy, Ugachi the Lizard Killer, does not behave at all like some NPC monster. He talks about a loss of face from having his arm cut off, and how unforgivable the action was, and demonstrates his own pain and anguish from his injury. His behavior is so unmonster-like that Kirito even wonders if he is an artificial fluctlight himself. The point of highlighting all that is that this fight started off in a very stereotypical manner, corny one-liners and all, and then progressed into something much different from the usual conflicts that we've seen in these game worlds. Even Ugachi's death is different. He doesn't shatter into pixels and disappear, but leaves a corpse, with a severed head that Kirito can brandish at the remaining goblins for intimidation. He and Yujo don't just have red marks on their body to signify injury, but they actually bleed, soaking their clothing and the environment with their blood. This just isn't the type of battle we've seen before in the series, so I feel like a precedent has been set for this world. Everything about it is more real, potentially even indistinguishable from reality, and that's going to include the pain and the stakes of battle. There is even mental stress and side effects to injury. Yujo remembers his shared youth with Kirito and Alice while he is at death's door, and then when Kirito gives up a significant portion of his life force to save him, he also has a kind of hallucination of Alice whispering to him. That's a lot different than just having a life meter slowly decrease, right? I expect the series itself to be more substantial in that respect then, but it does still behave like a game, as we saw in the usage of the Blue Rose Sword. While it seemed inevitable that the use of the sword and sword skills would be how Yujo finished his calling, it only worked because the incident with the goblins raised their level, uh, making the sword an item they could effectively use. A world full of artificial souls and realistic pain and emotions may feel very different to Kirito and feel completely real to the others, but it seems to still be bound by the rules of the underlying virtual reality experience. Thus, it seems the challenge will be to navigate to the limits set by the code and the realistic human interactions with the world's inhabitants. Kirito will have to think like a gamer on one hand and an actual member of this world on the other, and I can already guess that there will be tension in the gap between these two approaches. So that is all for today. Remember that the videos tomorrow will just be standalone versions of the Bunny Girl Senpai casual analysis and will not be new information if you have watched these main shows. So, see you next week.